Greetings YouTube. Uh, I have not prepared a script for you today. But what we're going to do, um, I got this message guided by uh, Spirit and the angels, and we are going to read a fairy tale. Um, I got some comments from you guys um, indicating that you'd like more stories. And so for those of you out there who never grew up with the privilege of being read stories by your parents or grandparents or anything like that. Or for those of you who did have that privilege and missed story time, this is going to be Light Wolf Story Time. Okay. So, this is a new thing we're doing. All right, I have this book. It's called Favorite Folk Tales of the World. I'll uh, put the name of the book below just in case. Uh, it's by Jane Yolen. And this story we're going to read today is called Jump Into My Sack. And it is from Italy. And now, I haven't read the story. I don't know what it's about. Uh... But I asked Spirit to guide me to the perfect story that would tie into the lesson and the message for next week. So uh, this is going to have a relation somehow very closely, I suppose, to the Libramancy video, which will be shortly forthcoming. Okay. Many, many years ago, in the barren mountains of Niolo, lived a father with 12 sons. A famine was raging, and the father said, My sons, I have no more bread to give you. Go out into the world, where you will certainly fare better than here at home. The eleven older boys were getting ready to leave, when the twelfth and youngest, who was lame, started weeping. And what will a cripple like me do to earn his bread? My child, said his father, don't cry. Go with your brothers. And what they earn will be yours as well. So the twelve promised to stay together always and departed. They walked a whole day, then a second. And the little lame boy fell constantly behind. On the third day, the oldest brother said, Our little brother Francis, who's always lagging, is nothing but a nuisance. Let's walk off and leave him on the road. That will be the best for him too. For some kind-hearted soul will come along and take pity on him. So they stopped no more to wait for him to catch up, but walked on, asking alms of everyone they met, all the way to Bonifacio. In Bonifacio, they saw a boat moored at the dock. What if we climbed in and sailed to Sardinia, said the oldest boy. Maybe there's less hunger there than in our land. The brothers got into the boat and set sail. When they were halfway across the straits, a fierce storm arose, and the boat was dashed to pieces on the reefs, and all eleven brothers drowned. Meanwhile, the little cripple Francis, exhausted and frantic when he missed his little brothers, screamed and cried and then fell asleep by the roadside. The farrier guardian of that particular spot had seen and heard everything from a treetop. As soon as Frances was asleep, she came down the tree, picked certain special herbs, and prepared a plaster, which she smoothed on the lame leg. Immediately the leg became sound. Then she disguised herself as a poor little old woman and sat down on a bundle of firewood to wait for Francis to wake up. Francis awakened, got up, prepared to limp off, and then realized he was no longer lame, but could walk like everyone else. He saw the little old woman sitting there and asked, Madam, have you by chance seen a doctor around here? A doctor? What do you want to eat the doctor? I want to thank him. A great doctor must certainly have come by while I was sleeping 
and cured my lame leg. I am the one who cured your lame leg, replied the little old woman, since I know all about herbs, including the one that heals lame legs. As pleased as punch, Francis threw his arms around the little old woman and kissed her on both cheeks. How can I thank you, ma'am? Here, let me carry your bundle of wood for you. He bent over to pick up the bundle, but when he stood up, he faced not the old woman, but the most beautiful maiden imaginable, all radiant with diamonds and blonde hair down her to her waist. She wore a deep blue dress embroidered with gold, and two stars of precious stones sparkled on her ankle boots. Dumbfounded, Frances fell at the fairy's feet. Get up, she said. I am well aware that you are grateful and I shall help you. Make two wishes, and I will grant them at once. I am the queen of the fairies of Lake Creno, mind you. The boy thought a bit and replied, I desire a sack that will suck in whatever I name, and just such a sack shall you have. Now make one more wish. I desire a stick that will do whatever I command. And just such a stick shall you have, replied the fairy, and vanished. At Francis's feet lay a sack and a stick. Overjoyed, the boy decided to try them out. Being hungry, he cried, a roasted partridge into my sack. <laughs> Zoom, a partridge fully roasted <laughs> flew into the sack. Probably not with wings and feathers, you know, the old-fashioned flu is basically just means rushed. Along with bread, zoom, a loaf of bread came sailing into the sack. Also, a bottle of wine. Zoom, there was a bottle of wine. Francis ate a first then he set out again, limping no longer. And the next day he found himself in Mariana, where the, four, where the most famous gamblers of Corsica and the continent were meeting. Francis didn't have a cent to his name, so he ordered, 100,000 crowns into my sack. And the sack filled with crowns. The news spread like wildfire, wildfire, <sighs> through, through Mariana that the fabulously wealthy prince of Santo Francesco had arrived. <clears throat> At that particular time, mind you, the devil was especially partial to the city of Mariana. Disguised as a handsome young man, he beat everybody at cards, and when the players ran out of money, he would purchase their souls. Hearing of this rich foreigner, who went by the name of Prince of Santo Francesco. The devil in disguise approached him without delay. Noble Prince, pardon my boldness in coming to you, but your fame as a gambler is so great that I couldn't resist calling on you. You put me to shame, replied Francis. To tell the truth, I don't know how to play any game at all, nor have I ever had a deck of cards in my hand. However, I would be happy to play a hand with you just for the sake of learning the game. And I'm sure that with you as a teacher, I'll be an expert in no time. The devil was so gratified by the visit that upon taking leave and bowing goodbye, he negligently stretched out a leg and showed his cloven hoof. Oh me, said Francis to himself. So this is old Satan himself, who has honored me with a visit. Very well, he will meet his match. Once more alone, he commanded of the sack a fine dinner. Hmm. The next day, <coughs> Francis went to the casino. There was a great turmoil with all the people crowded around one particular spot. Francis pushed through and saw, on the ground, 
the body of a young man with a blood-stained chest. He was a gambler, someone explained, who lost his entire fortune and thrust a dagger into his heart not a minute ago. All the gamblers were sad-faced, but one, noted Francis, stood in their midst, laughing up his sleeve. It was the devil who had paid Francis a visit. Mm. Quick, said the devil, let's take this unfortunate man out and get on with the game. And they all picked up their cards once more. Francis, who didn't even know how to hold cards in his hand, lost everything he had with him that day. By the second day, he knew a little bit about the game, but lost still more than the day before. By the third day, he was an expert and lost so much that everyone was sure he was ruined. But the loss did not trouble him in the least, since there was his sack he could command and then find inside all the money he needed. He lost so much money that the devil thought to himself, he might have been the richest man in existence to start with, but he's surely about to end up now with nothing to his name. Noble Prince, he said, taking him aside, I can't tell you how sorry I am over the misfortune that has befallen you, but I have good news for you. Heed my words and you will recover half of what you lost. How? The devil looked around, then whispered, Sell me your soul. Ah, cried Francis. So that's your advice to me, Satan? Go on, jump into my sack. The devil smirked and aimed to flee, but there was no escape. He flew headfirst into the yawning sack, which just means mouth wide open which Francis closed, then addressed the stick. Now pound him for all you're worth. Blows rained fast and furious. Inside the devil writhed, cried, cursed. Let me out, let me out. Stop or you will kill me. Really? You'll give up the ghost? W would that be a loss? Do you think? And the stick went right on beating him. After three hours of that shower, Francis spoke. That will do, at least for today. What, what will you take in return for setting me free? Asked the devil in a weak voice. Listen carefully. If you want your freedom back, you must bring back to life at once. Every one of those poor souls who killed themselves in the casino because of you. You see, being a weak and unknowing child in the world, Francis had a weak voice to start with. But once he faced the devil and stood up to him, and then asked for help for the rest of the people, not just himself, he began to grow a manly voice, a voice of maturity and of wisdom. It's a bargain, replied the devil. Come on out then, but remember, I can catch you again any time I feel like it. The devil dared not go back on his word. He approached and disappeared underground, and in almost no time up came a throng of young men, pale face and with feverish eyes. My friends, his voice gets more mature, said Francis, you ruined yourselves gambling, and the only way out was to kill yourselves. I was able to have you brought back this time, but I might not be able to do so another time. Will you promise me to gamble no more? Yes, yes, we promise. <clears throat> Fine. Here are a thousand crowns for each of you. Go in peace and earn your bread honestly. Overjoyed, the revived youths departed, some returning to families in mourning, others striking out on their own, their past misdeeds having been the death of their parents. 
Francis, too, thought of his old father. He set out for his village, but along the way met a boy wringing his hands in despair. How now, young man? Do you make wry faces for sale? asked Francis in high spirits. How much are they by the dozen? I don't feel like laughing, sir, replied the boy. What's the matter? My father's a woodcutter and the sole support of our family. This morning he fell out of a chestnut tree and broke his arm. I ran into town for the doctor, but he knows we are poor and refused to come. Is that all that's worrying you? Set your mind at rest. I'll take care of things. You're a doctor? No, but I'll make that one come. What's his name? Dr. Pancrazio. Fine. Dr. Pancrazio, jump into my sack. Into the sack headfirst went a doctor with all his instruments. Stick, pound him for all you're worth. And the stick began its dance. Help! Mercy! Do you promise to cure the woodcutter free of charge? I, I promise whatever you ask. Get out of the sack then. And the doctor ran to the woodcutter's bedside. Francis continued on his way and in a few days came to his village where even greater hunger now raged than before. By constantly repeating, into my sack, a roasted chicken, a bottle of wine. Francis managed to provision an inn where all could go and eat their fill without paying a penny. He did this for as long as the famine lasted, but he stopped once times of plenty returned, so as not to encourage laziness. Do you think he was happy, though? Of course not. He was sad without any news of his eleven brothers. He had long since forgiven them for running off and leaving him, a helpless cripple. He tried saying, Brother John, jump into my sack. Something stirred inside the sack. Francis opened it and found a heap of bones. Brother Paul, jump into my sack. Another heap of bones. Brother Peter, jump into my sack. Calling them all up to the eleventh, he found each time, alas, only a little pile of bones half gnawed in two. There was no doubt about it. His brothers had all died together. Francis was sad. His father also died, leaving him all alone. Then it was his turn to grow old. His last remaining desire before dying was to see again the fairy of Le Greno who had made him so prosperous. He therefore set out and reached the place where he had first met her. He waited and waited, but the fairy did not come. Where are you, good queen? Please appear one more time. I can't die until I've seen you again. Night had fallen and there was still no sign of the fairy. Instead, here came death down the road. In one hand, she held a black banner and in the other, her scythe. She approached Francis saying, Well, man, are you not yet weary of life? Haven't you been over enough hills and dales? Isn't it time you did as everyone else and came along with me? Oh, death, replied Francis, bless you. Yes, I have seen enough of the world and everything in it. I have had my fill of everything. But before coming with you, I must first bid someone farewell. Allow me one more day. Say your prayers if you don't want to die like a heathen and hurry after me. Please wait until the cock crows in the morning. No. Just one more hour then. Not even one minute more. Since you are so cruel, then jump into my sack. Death shuddered, all her bones rattled, but she had no choice but to jump into the sack. In the same instant appeared the queen of the fairies, as radiant and youthful as the first time. Fairy, said Francis, I thank you. Then he addressed Death. Jump out of the sack and attend to me. <clears throat> you have never abused the power I gave you, Francis, 
said the fairy. Your sack and your stick have always been put to good use. I shall reward you if you tell me what you will like. I have no more desires. Would you like to be a chieftain? No. Would you like to be a king? I wish nothing more. Now that you are an old man, would you like health and youth again? I have seen you, and I'm content to die. Farewell, Francis. But first, burn the sack and the stick. And the fairy vanished. The good Francis built a big fire, warmed his frozen limbs briefly, then threw the sack and the stick into the flames so that no one could put them to evil use. Death was hiding behind a bush. Cock a doodle doo! Cock a doodle doo! crowed the first cock. Francis did not hear. Age had made him deaf. There's the cock crowing, announced Death, and struck the old man with her scythe. Then she vanished, bearing his mortal remains. The end. So, what do we think about that story? Do you notice those of you who know mythology or comparative religion? Do you notice symbols and archetypes found in other mythologies? For instance, I'll give you a hint. One of the things is a sack of plenty, which is from Celtic mythology, uh, where Anything somebody wanted would come out of it just by wishing. Another is the magic stick that does whatever you want. This could be uh, analogized in the story of Moses in the Bible when he throws down Aaron's rod or the staff in front of Pharaoh and it turns into a snake. Uh, another biblical connection, if you think about when Jesus... Uh, fed the multitudes, and when we're talking multitudes, we're talking like a, between a thousand and five thousand people. That's what a multitude is. When Jesus fed the multitudes, um, actually, it, it was his disciples that he had feed them. He told them to put them up to the, the baskets up to the sky, and they would be filled. Actually, I'm not 100% positive on that. That's something I saw in a TV adaptation of the Acts of the Apostles, so maybe maybe it didn't exactly happen that way. But we all know the story of the loaves and the fishes. They had, like, just a little bit uh, to feed, you know, maybe half of their disciples. And then, miraculously, it was turned into enough to feed, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 people. That would also be... Um, related then in concept, in archetype, in um, mythological, oh, I don't know what the Joseph Campbell term would be, but uh, like a prop, like a symbol. In symbolism, it would be related to the, the sack of plenty. Also, there, um, what is it, uh, in Norse mythology, Odin, a king gives Odin a, a horn to drink from, and it, he just keeps drinking, and it never empties, and it's because it's coming from a lake or a river or something like that. But so, things that never empty, or things that continually give you whatever you ask for, um, it could even be related to a genie and a lamp. Although I would say it's a little bit of a stretch. We're not just talking about something that grant us, grants wishes. We're talking about something that gives you whatever you want forever. Continuously provides what you need. This also is the message of Spirit. The Holy Spirit within you will continuously provide you whatever you need. Now whether you believe in the Christian idea of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, etc., or whether you believe in the universal um, animus that animates all people with its motion and vibration, etc. Or some version in between. It's not about the messenger. Those are all messengers. 
The question is, did you get the message? Thank you for joining me today for Light Wolf Story Time. Uh, if you have any favorite stories you'd like us to uh, read, let us know, and I'll see if I can get a hold of the story and, and read it online for you um, on on uh, on the channel. Also, uh, I don't know if anybody noticed, but I had a comment from one viewer that uh, the back looked really cr uh, crowded and busy, and it was kind of chaotic energy. And I understand that. I do. And I'm just doing what I can one, one piece at a time. Um, and what I was able to do to help some of what was directly behind me was take a Celtic tapestry that I have, and that's what you see in the back. So that's going to be behind me from now on when I do these videos. Uh, this stuff over here, I probably will put some crystals up there so you guys can look at crystals. Um, maybe a statue or two. I know the books are going to stay up there because that's where they go. These papers here are probably going to get moved. I might put some jars or something. You guys have any suggestions? I'm open to uh, decoration suggestions about my room. Uh, if you like my hair or don't like my hair, uh, colors, anything, anything you want to suggest. I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but I love ideas. And I will take all your advice under consideration. Thank you again for joining me uh, on uh, Light Wolf Shamanic Healing YouTube channel. Um, if you want a reading, go ahead and head to my Facebook page at Light Wolf Shamanic Healing. Uh, I just put in a deal. There's a special on aura readings right now for the first 100 viewers. Um, going through the end it says march but it's going through the end of april and instead of the normal price of eighty dollars it's only going to be seventeen dollars now i'll show you how i do an aura aura reading um i'll need a volunteer to send me a photo and i need somebody who doesn't mind having their personal business put out there because spirit's going to show me whatever you, you've you um, not locked in your personal Akashic records. Spirit's going to show me all the horrible shit that's been done to you, all the horrible shit that you've done to other people in this life and in the past. And I don't judge. I've seen it all. I don't even care. But everybody else in the world is going to see who happens to see this video. So keep that in mind. If you want to submit a photo, that's what you will be subject to. But... If you submit a photo um, on this channel or a reference that you saw on this YouTube video, um, my request to submit a photo, I will do a reading for you for free. This, will, this offer is for the first three people to submit a photo. I'll do a free reading online um, on this YouTube channel. Um, I don't do kids. You know, if the reading is about you and children are important in your life, that stuff will come out. But I don't do readings on children because uh, I just don't. Bad experience. <laughs> um, other than that, remember to like and subscribe. And this is where the theme music would play for outro if I had some. I'm going to work on that eventually also and uh yeah thank you and share and have a great day blessings